All right, guys, working on the Thor this morning. It's a, uh, it's an Axis or Vegas, it's a very small class A. And this is gonna be electrical diagnostics, my favorite. Customer complaint is that the battery disconnect is not working all the time. And he also believes he has a parasitic draw on the house side of the batteries, the coach side, the chassis side is fine, which I replaced the solenoid a while ago on that side because uh, it had a problem before and it was killing um, the chassis battery. And that um, there's like a automatic solenoid that is supposed to serve as an isolator um, when the coach is off and the key's not in the ignition. Okay, so first thing, brought out my case. It's the only tools that I have besides my EDCs and this is where I, I like to to keep this is why this is in this kit so the first thing I want to do is check the batteries the house batteries are here and these are 12 volt batteries which are connected in parallel which means I can connect anywhere on them let's get a little light Okay, this is the negative, and this is the positive. So, uh, connect here, and connect here, and uh, we can see because the switch doesn't work right now, but that's because the batteries are far below empty. Uh, anything under 10 volts, nothing really works in the camper. So as we can see, the batteries are down below six volts and um my tester is calling for us to recharge the batteries so he was saying the only way he could get it to come on is for the truck to run for a while well that's consistent because the batteries are dead <laughs> all right so now that we see that i can kind of just leave that like that this tool kind of freaks out when the battery is being charged. It does not have a very high sampling rate. And when that sampling rate is exceeded, it will simply stop. Stop working. Well, it'll put all dashes. So we'll go ahead and start the vehicle. solenoid kicks in it just did i heard the click and now you get out of line which means hey way above my sampling rate something's not right i'm not gonna give you any data so now we'll switch to a regular multimeter look at the charge voltage All right, guys, the the job with the uh, the parasitic drain, you can't test that stuff unless the battery's already charged. If it's already dead, there's nothing you can do. So I uh, got that one on the battery charger. It's gonna charge overnight and everything, and I'll go back out there and, and actually find out what's going on with that. Might just be some bad batteries uh, from the history that I know of on the vehicle. Now on this one, working on this Wildwood, Got a couple things to do on this one. You know, replace the toilet because the toilet is relatively cheap. And by the time you pay for the labor to take both the valves out it and change out the foot pedal, it's messed up. You know, you can just buy another toilet. We got, we got some leaks that we're going to fix in the shower area, in the kitchen area. And then we're going to do a custom uh, faucet install in the kitchen. So uh, we got a... Uh, we got this guy. We're gonna get rid of that. And uh, 
The one that I bought, it requires two holes, so I have to pull out the hole saws and everything and uh, do that. Also be uh, finishing the repair on the water heater. Okay, so got our work cut out for us. Let me go ahead and get at it. All right, 716 sockets on that. Using the SK kit. It is made in the USA. SK has been around for like 100 years, guys. They have manufacturing plants here in the United States. They do still make tools here. They don't make all their tools here, but they decided to keep some of their tools here. So it doesn't matter who they're owned by, they still make <laughs> their products in the USA. So uh, just want to address that. I mean, man, think about it, bro. Don't the Chinese like own Ford or somebody? Like one of the major car makers like Ford, like the Chinese have like over a 50% interest in the company. And they don't even make most of them here anymore. They made in Mexico and Canada and it's it's a fiasco man it's either ford or gm i think it might be gm but anyway just because a foreign entity owns a company it doesn't means that all of the products instantly goes to crap or that they they kill all the u.s manufacturing they're going to kill a lot of it but some of it's still around they still make some chevys around here i bought a chevy truck brand new has a sticker on it, made in Wayne, Indiana. So there's that. But for this job, I grab my plumbing bag, got my plumbing bag out, use my Knipex, pull the caps off. And now I got my, uh, what I gotta do, I've already loosened the line and plugged it from the previous visit. I've been here before, I'm tracking down a leak. So this was a big source of a leak. So, uh, As you can see, I'm glad this side is real open so you can see that that uh, slim, that slim quarter inch socket can fit in there. S different toilets are different. This is like a Dometic 310. And uh, I, yes, I could have fixed this toilet, but for what the flat rates call for, for me to fix the components on this toilet, you can get one of these things for less than 200 bucks. So. It would be cheaper. My labor rate is 118 an hour with a minimum trip charge of $60. So you're looking at a bare minimum to just start working on it at $200. I think it's an hour just to remove and replace it. And then there's a flat rate for each component that you have to change out. It adds up to being more than a toilet is worth. So if you got a cheap toilet like this, just replace it, bro. It's only held on with two 716 nuts and a, a hose. So this is the one that's a little harder to get to because the, uh, the foot pedal is in the way. So you can't fit that socket in there. Normally end up going for wrench for that 716. Got my Husky set out. What I like about these Husky wrenches is that they're straight. I need a straight wrench. I'm normally grabbing for those. Like no offset. It's just straight. In some situations, that's preferred. A shallow socket wouldn't work because uh, the stud is too long. As you can see, that straight wrench is perfect. I do have an obstruction right above, so I don't want to use a 45 degree offset one or anything like that. And I definitely don't want to use a non-ratcheting wrench. And you can tell this is much faster. And that was on there pretty tight and it still has good resistance on it. Probably across there. see where it's at might just be spinning a stud in which case i have to put pressure on it with the uh toilet but there we go yep put 
tilt in the toilet, put pressure on the flange of the nut. But yeah, so basically what I'm doing is just lifting up on the toilet like that to put pressure on the base of the flange nut so that it won't spin the uh, stud and it will uh, come off because this is somebody cross at this one here. All right, so this is an upgrade because this is a plastic toilet. This one's uh, looks like it's a little taller. Maybe, maybe not. But anyway, uh, same height. So as you can see, if your toilet is leaking from around this base, it's because that uh, gasket. See how the new one has a gasket here? If it's leaking from in here, you have this, this valve if it's leaking from around here. If it's leaking inside the bowl and it never stops, well, you have a vacuum breaker right there. And uh, when you have all that stuff and it's all messed up and just get rid of the toilet, man. Like I said, like $170 for a plastic one like that. So let me get this one installed. I think it comes with all new hardware, new caps. We're gonna use all the new stuff. New studs, new washers. So we'll get all the new stuff installed, get rid of the old rusty cruddy stuff and keep it moving. All right, so just like that, got the new toilet installed with the new hardware. I leave the old stuff so the customer can know, hey, I really did change everything. Uh, Forest River didn't do a very good job with the plumbing on this. As you can see, the toilet is really too close to the piping. They're not gonna go through and redo the floor after they've made that mistake. They just bend the pipe like that. If it, I probably will end up replumbing that. It is the way the manufacturer designed it, but as you can see on the fitting, how it's sitting, if it doesn't leak right now, it's gonna leak down the road. And even though you did it right back the way the factory did it, it's gonna be your fault and you're gonna get the bad review for it. So it's, you gotta do more work and you have to end up putting, uh, cutting that fitting out, putting in the elbow, bringing it over and then taking it back to where the part that goes into the toilet is square. And then you'll have to uh, fix it on the other end. What I normally do with that is uh, when I have to replumb them, I go ahead and put a shutoff valve on it. Yep, I, I cut that off send it one way put a shutoff valve on it and send it back to the toilet that way if you ever have to work on it again at least you don't have to turn all the water off all right so water leak somewhere in the shower <laughs> the customer decided to uh, cut a hole there or that might have been a factory hole um, as a matter of fact there should have been a factory hole there anyway to uh, access the p-trap the water leak is coming from the fixture. It's gonna be bad washers on the uh, on the back side of that. You can simply take a number two square, pretty easy. Take all the screws out. I've already diagnosed this, so I know that's what it is. But at the time when I started working on this, customers wasn't here. He just left it open, but there was nobody to pay me. So if I can't get paid, I don't do the work. So this time he showed up, he had to leave again, but I had his bill ready. So he paid me before he left. And uh, what's leaking is this side, the washer that is inside here, it's leaking. I'll probably go ahead and change them both out since I'm here, because if it leaks again later, you're gonna get blamed for it. So. Let's do a little extra work and uh, fix the side that's not leaking too. Put a new washer in it too. All right, so uh, let me get that done and we'll be back. 
All right, these are the two pipes. When I took that off, that, that fixture is pretty loose. So I went ahead and tightened those collars. And now you can see into our fixture and I'll be changing out both of these washers. I just get a pick and pull those out. And they should be pushed in way. Yeah, they're just so, yeah, that's why it's leaking. So we're gonna replace both of those and put this back together. And that's most of the leaks that were in here. Had a very large leak from the toilet and we had a pretty significant leak coming from here. So we will, uh, I will plug them first and turn the water on and, uh, and make sure we're good before I actually go through the trouble of putting the fixture back on. So I keep a lot of those plugs on my truck. So let me do that and we'll be back. All right, for this repair, we got a pick, two new cone washers and a couple temporary plugs for me to check for leaks. Before I put that on there, it's a lot easier to see if it's leaking uh, from anywhere else with the plugs. And then if it passes that test, I'll go with my uh, fixture and we'll be good to go. So let's get this. All right, now that the leaks have been repaired, let's, I turned on the water so we can see if the stuff's leaking. So this did good, got it connected. It's not leaking because it was pretty much gushing out. A little air in the water heater. We got hot water. That's something else that I repaired. Needed a heating element and an anode rod. Hopefully it didn't go, it didn't rust out the tank. It looks pretty rusty from the outside. So I'm just gonna run this hot water for a while. Get the air out. Same thing on the cold side. I had the low point drains open when I work on the plumbing. And basically just gotta let the stuff, uh, before I had a big stream of water coming from here and from there coming through the wall after about five minutes of the water being on. I also had some water coming from over here somewhere. And I, uh, I also have to, uh, Diagnosis this refrigerator, um, which is not working. As you can see, error code, that, that means that when the refrigerator tried to start up, it, it could not pull enough current and it has to come out. So uh, yeah, I put in this new sink, which is gonna require some custom work. So I'll be working on that while I'm waiting for uh, the water leaks to manifest themselves and then Actually, I got got to wait because uh, I have to turn the water off and plug the lines first because I have to open up two water lines back there in order to get to the sink. If I had one of these things, I put shutoff valves on everything. Every every place where I had a line to where I could service, I'd have some sh shutoff valves to isolate this stuff. But yeah, so I'll be diagnosing this today too, guys. Okay, I'm about to start working on the sink. Uh, let's highlight some tools. This is a blue point kit that is awesome. Get this kit guys. This is an awesome kit. The case is nice and rugged, has like a rubber over mold, over mold on it. And there's enough space as you can see to put like extra stuff in here. I keep a set of nut drivers in there too. And a uh, socket adapter, um, the snap on mat. So I have to get under the sink to work on it. And there's that ridge right there. I, these long snap-on mats, which are made by Lang. I also have the Lang ones, which are about 25% of the price. You can use this, lay it over there and it doesn't dig it, hurt your back so much. Cause I got to kind of lay under there because inside here is a, uh, if you look up there, there is a collar that has two screws in it and to, uh, before you can twist the collar off, you have to loosen the screws. So, <laughs> helps to be able to get under there. All right, let me get at it. Okay, as you can see, I got straight up at it with this angle and I'm in a very comfortable position because of my, uh, because of my mat. And if you're in a tight spot and you can't get this direct access, I took the screws all the way out. You're gonna wanna leave them in, just loosen them up and then you can use them as a handle to twist this off. Once you get that off, 
that's free and you can uh, pull it out after you disconnect the lines. I have the water on right now. I'll be turning the water off, opening the low point drains and installing my new uh, faucet. Okay, I'll be back. Okay, when it comes to cutting holes for these uh, faucets, it's a one-time deal. This, this particular model, you need two holes for, so I have to cut a new hole. Uh, if you don't know what size hole saw to use, this is a one and a half. Um, cut a test hole in the box and then try it out. Because sometimes the instructions don't tell you the size they assume you're doing a direct replacement. So uh, in this case, I uh, did my test hole in the box with the one and a half, it fit good. And uh, of course, there we go. Because this has to be bigger so it can tighten up on the outside part that's not cut. So that's, that's how I do it. I take a piece of paper, cardboard, and then and then I do it quick and easy. So I'll get my, uh, my level, find my center, and then pop me another hole for, for this guy right here. I'll be back. All right, got that installed. Let's see some of the tools we use. Uh, I typically keep, these are some of the common sizes that I use, it's three inch um, and the one and a half inch. So I keep those already tooled up with the arbors in them, but I do have the rest of the kit. And this is a Milwaukee holdozer set. I'm using a DeWalt arbor for the big stuff. Um, Cause I do have, you know, I use like four inch and six inch. I'm doing different washer dryer setups and uh, different little uh, custom builds and stuff. So uh, we got that, we got the water on and getting pressurized. Go ahead and get the air out of the line. Hot and cold side. And let's see uh, if we have any leaks while I'm putting this set of tools away. And what I have left is the Everchill refrigerator, which are notorious for, uh, well, they all have their own special problems and stuff. But, uh, these things don't seem to, to hold up very well. So uh, I think the Furions are better, but who knows, it might be the same thing. So let me let me get this thing pulled out of here so I can start diagonal the power, do a hard reset on it. So we're working on a refrigerator now. Uh, I use my, I keep one of these for doing wheelbarrows and stuff. Since I'm by myself um, on this one, what I do is, uh, I pull it out enough to fit a block of wood in between this, which is on the bottom. I'm just showing you from the top. And then I use my jack and I jack it up level. There's wheels on the back of the refrigerator. Then I roll it all the way out. I tilt it back and I have all the weight on the block and the jack has wheels It easily rolls. And then I pull it out and then I lower the jack down, tilt it back off of the block get it on the ground, kick the block from under it, and there she is. So, refrigerator's not cooling. It is pulling about a little under five amps. The code is saying it's not getting enough power. It's pulling about five amps. It might just need to be hard reset. Uh, so put on the positive, you get a positive amp draw. So four amps. And let's see what's the uh, RLA. So right now the compressor is running. I can feel it vibrating. So it's calling for cool. And it's been running the whole time. Uh, it has R134A in it, which doesn't mean anything to me. 11 amps. So rated current is 11 amps. It's only pulling uh, four. Typically, uh, that would mean you you have low resistance in the compressor. It's low on refrigerant. So I'll do a hard reset and, and see if that helps it at all. Because like I said, the compressor is running, but it, the error code says it didn't have enough power. So I'll take some 
voltage measurements and uh, see what my see what my voltage is and let's go ahead and do that get him set up for volts DC let's see what we have and it looks like they do have i remember it was a recall on a lot of these campers because they had the wrong gauge wire and they couldn't pull enough power because of that but this one seems to have the uh the fix was to put 10 gauge wire so we got 12.8 is what we have going into it get my meter set up here guys um should be a little higher than that i mean that's enough to run it but uh typically when the converter is running and everything you have 13 13.6 volts but that's that's enough to run it it's almost 13 so i can check the battery and see what what the battery is getting the converter is right behind there so let me do a hard reset on it take the power away from it put it back on it see what happens